interview with Barry Garari, take number four. We were talking about uh, the mode of dress, yes. and I asked you about um, how your father and grandfather dressed. Yes. Well, the mode of dress varies from one country to another. I don't remember on my own what the mode of dress was in, in Russia. In uh, Latvia, the mode of dress was uh, for men was a uh, gray suit with a double-breasted uh, double jacket, not a long coat. In uh, Latvia, the mode of dress for a... Uh, th that was in Latvia, I'm sorry. In Poland, the mode of dress for a for a Hasidic person was a black coat, knee, uh, almost ankle long, or at least mid-calf long. So right there, you have a difference. In, uh, and there are degrees of difference, of course. Now, in addition to the color, the material, in Poland, the Sabbath coat, or the Yontet coat, would be made out of silk. The, uh, the weekday coat would be a cloth, which was not a silk, necessarily. Uh, in between, you find all kinds of gradations. Some people would uh, dress in silk all the time. That was usually a rebbe. That would be typical of a rebbe in Poland. It would be in silk, and it would be a long coat all the time. Uh, a chosid in Poland, many of them would not wear silks during the week, but they would wear still a long black coat. Some of them would wear just black jackets, black pants, of course. Some Hasidic groups in Poland wore white socks, especially the Rebbe would wear white socks, and possibly white underpants. Because of the very long coat, th those underpants served like pants. So there was a whole range of dress. And generally, the Lubavitcher Hasidim who came from Russia tended to wear gray jackets. The ones who were uh, in Poland would wear black and would occasionally wear silk. My grandfather always wore a black jacket, as I remember. But I, rem I don't remember him wearing silk except on holidays in the early years. Later, there was more silk. But again, we were in a different country. My father, again, the same thing, but uh, in Poland, I d in uh, Sydney, in Latvia, I don't remember him wearing long uh, coat that much. For myself, uh, I took advantage to stay as, uh, as gray as I could, if you will, within the permissible bounds. What do you remember most about your, your grandfather's shul? What I remember most about my grandfather's shul was that it wasn't the shul that was important, it was the people. His grandfather, it was the kind of relationship he had with his p followers. And the shul was a shul. The shul was a place which became holy by containing the right people. What was your bar mitzvah like? My bar mitzvah was in Natvotsk, even though we at the time still lived in Warsaw. It was probably at the yeshiva, at least that's my recollection. I remember that a number of notables came there because of my grandfather, obviously. Uh, it has been custom for, it has been a custom in my years in Chabad for the bar mitzvah boy to repeat one of the malmarim of the Rebbe. 
and so I had studied and was ready to repeat it properly. And uh, I remember that quite a number of different rebels came to that, to that God. Where was it? Was it the yeshiva? It was at a plain table, not necessarily a very elegant table. I think that it did have a tablecloth on it, which would indicate that it was regarded as a kind of a holiday. A treat in those days used to be something like herring, cut up herring, and maybe a little mashke, mashke being, mashke is the Hebrew word for a drink but it is used primarily for uh, vodka. And that's about it. Who were the notables who attended? For the life of me, I don't remember. I mean, obviously my grandfather, obviously my father, obviously some of the elder Hasidim, but who were the other notables that were there? With all due respect, I, this is a sign of bad memory on my part. Now, just as an excuse, let me point out that that was 61 years ago. So, memories do fade. What about your extended family, your aunts and uncles? Did you see them frequently? Well, both my uncles on my mother's side would always come, and the, my aunts on mother's side would always come for Yontif to my grandfather. On very special occasions, they stayed there for much longer periods. Uh, my aunts and my uncles on uh, my father's side, I remember Sonia, who was one of his sisters, who was a very smart and learned woman, very unusual in those days. The education of Russian Orthodox women had been intentionally neglected in those years. Uh, but she had studied on her own, and she was very smart. Uh, she later, she married a man by the name of Rosenblum, and she had uh, two daughters. Last I've checked, both of them were living in Israel. Her husband had passed away. Now, he had also a number of brothers. My, I think my, I forget now how many children was, there were in the family, but I think there was close to 10. So I remember one of them, Yisrolik, or Yisrolik is diminutive for Israel. For Israel. Uh, he was a man who uh, was looking for various kinds of occupations, as was so typical of many Jews in those days, uh, was having his problems. He had a nice family. He lived in Warsaw, didn't survive, nor did his family. I also remember another one by the name of Nazi, Nazi being in this case a diminutive for Nosen, Natan. And uh, we, I shouldn't use the word Nazi because it has other implications which are in no way connected with him. It was just a, a Russian uh, nickname applied to him and it anteceded the German movement. So there's no, uh, no intention to apply that to him. But uh, I remember him. Uh, he was sort of difficult, and uh, he was a difficult person. He had a difficult life. Still has a daughter survived. As an only child, were you particularly close to any of your cousins, or did you have any particularly close friends? No. I don't recommend being an, an, an only child. And, <coughs> and how did your father support the family? Well, it's the same story. My father was learned, a Hasidus, 
and then uh, nigla, so-called nigla being the open part of the Bible. That's not the, not the mystical part, not the Kabbalistic part, but the, the uh, so-called open part. He was very learned in both of those areas. His parents had been involved in some kind of uh, trade. Again, in the, there were all kinds of limitations on Jews doing various things in Russia. Uh, in the years I remember, in the early years where we were in Riga and in the early years in Poland, he had tried uh, various aspects of the diamond trade. Not making the diamond, but selling it, buying and selling. Uh, later, he and mother spent a year in Israel trying to establish a business. Uh, what he was trying to do was to invest in various in land and buy and sell. Neither of these two was that successful. Uh, and then uh, in the middle 30s, he became the, uh, the head of the yeshiva in, in Tvotsk. And he worked long and hard at that. In fact, he worked at that particular job till his, uh, at the end of his days. Uh, he was quite successful in, get, in raising funds for the issue. He was moderately successful in his administrative activities. You mentioned a year in Israel. Did you go to Israel? No, I stayed in Poland, and I was in uh, my grandfather's house. Uh, Mendel Musa stayed in Poland for that particular period. So that was another opportunity for me to get a little closer with Mendel Musa Schneerson, especially Mendel. He was at the time a student this was already, see, I, my bar mitzvah was in 36, so this must have been about 1935. And in 1935, he, was, or he had already left Berlin, and he was by now a student at the Ecole Normale, at least I think it was the Ecole Normale in Paris. He was studying electrical engineering. The electrical engineering in those days entailed large rotating machinery. And every engineer had to have a way of putting his ideas into visible form. Someone had to learn drafting. Well, he had studied drafting and he, had, he used to come <coughs> to the, he used to come or he was rather in that at that time at uh, in Warsaw. He was uh, busy preparing various uh, proposals or whatever. I don't know exactly what, but I used to sit for hours and uh, look at how he did the drafting, and try to ask about all kinds of uh, technical aspects of this. I found that this was probably closer to my own natural interests and where many of the other things that I was studying. Did you pursue those interests? Well, uh, I finished high school, it was in 1942. And while I was still at the yeshiva, uh, what I did then was spend about half a year or so studying more intensively uh, in the yeshiva, and getting into the studies I would need in order to be, in order to get a smicha, or an ordination as a rabbi. And I spent, then I entered Brooklyn College. That was probably in the fall of 43, if as I remember correctly. And in college, I originally was going to go for a pre-engineering curriculum. In fact, I was thinking of electrical engineering. Now, as it turned out, if I had gone for 
pre-engineering, I could take pre-engineering at Brooklyn College, which was reasonably close. If I wanted to get into the engineering program directly, I would have to go to City College. We lived in Brooklyn, from Brooklyn to City College. It's a long, it's a long haul. So I was very happy that they had a pre-engineering program in Brooklyn. Of course, I got into the pre-engineering program in Brooklyn, and I got interested in various other subjects. One of them that I had to take was physics. And I got interested in physics. So after a while, I decided to switch my mass, uh, my major from engineering to physics. And that was the field I pursued, actually. Physics I could study at Brooklyn College. I didn't have to move to, uh, to, and, uh, to uh, City College of New York, CCNY. Getting back to Poland in the 30s, um, did you evidence your interest then? I'm sure I did in one way or another, although there were no specific items come to mind, no specific occasions. But I certainly, I certainly had a much stronger interest in that than I did in uh, the other studies that I was pursuing. Now, interestingly enough, now that the years have gone on and I've had this, an opportunity to look at various sides of the picture, I now have much more of an interest in things like law and sociology, which wa at one time I would have looked at and uh, shrugged, and psychology for that matter. But that, I think, comes partly with age and varied experience. In the 30s in Poland, uh, what awareness did you have of Hitler's rise to power in Germany? Well, we had it partly because we kept on hearing about various things that were happening to Jews. We've heard that we, of course, visited, Mother and I both visited Germany. And uh, we knew that Uncle had to depart from Germany and go to France. My other uncle, Mendel, Menachem Mendel Hornstein, also went to France, he never went to Germany. So we were generally aware of that. We were aware to some extent towards the end of the threat that Germany presented. But I can't say that I was an uh, expert in that area. Your parents had gone to Palestine. Um, did, was there ever talk about emigrating in the 30s? Yes. That was, what they were, that was what my father wanted to do. He wanted to establish himself in a way so he would be dependent on, uh, so he would be an independent uh, operator, if you will. But uh, life didn't turn out that way. So he ended up going back, and while he was in Poland, my grandfather always adroitly managed to bring one thing or another to his, uh, to his attention until he got him interested in doing something about the issue. And from then on, that's how it went. Now, my uncle was a little harder to persuade. He was in France. And he had very, very definitely made up his mind he was going to be in a different field. Uh, it wasn't until he came to the United States in 1940, 41, excuse me. And then his father died soon thereafter. By that time, he had the problem that one, he didn't have a very good job here. Number two, he wasn't going to school here. Number three, he had to say Kaddish every day, three times a day. And uh, 
So gradually he sort of got into doing the things that he had to do for the next few months. Well, grandfather gave him some work to do. Publish this, publish that, edit such and such a thing, edit such and such a thing. Gradually there, became <coughs> there came in an organization called Merkaz Lingyani Chinuch, Center for Educational Matters, and which was largely a publishing house. And so he sort of persuaded uncle to be temporarily the head of it. The temporary turned into a permanent occupation. Where were you when the Germans invaded Poland in 39? Well, the first time I knew about it, I was sitting in my bed, getting dressed. I was going to the yeshiva. And then I heard some peculiar noises, which sounded as if her bombs were falling. So I ran to the window, couldn't see a thing. <coughs> I ran out into the yard, <coughs> looked up, and there I could see a dogfight. Or at least what looked like a dogfight. And I saw there were bombs falling. And about an hour later, people came and told us that, sent us, the, orphan, the orphanage had been hit by some of the earliest bombs. It wasn't completely destroyed, but there was damage and casualties. And what did you do at that point? Well, I wasn't really the one who was making decisions at that point. <coughs> but my f the family, my grandfather, decided fairly quickly that the way to do it <coughs> was to get into a place from which he could organize a savings organization for Polish Jews. So that's really uh, savings organi organizations to save Jews in various countries was something in which he specialized against his desire. History imposed it on him. <coughs> he, as an individual, would have been probably happier to work quietly with a small group of people. He was forced into becoming more and more public. He was forced in enlarging his activities, largely because of his commitment to the, to the task, which was making sure that religious jury, jury survive, and in fact other members of the Jewish group survived. <coughs> so he concluded that he had to get out and start this kind of work. The obvious way was to go to Latvia, because we were all Latvian citizens, all except for Menzik and Sh Sonia. <coughs> Unfortunately, Menzik and Sonia had come to visit that particular uh, summer. They had come to visit their, uh, their respective parents, so they both were in Atvosk. So we went to, to Latvia because of that. Now, going to Latvia was not a simple task. The bombs, uh, originally we started packing, grandmother had a large balabatishkeit. A balabatishkeit is, of course, the household. And she wanted to preserve all of that. Grandfather had a sizable library, and he wanted to preserve that. And the mentality still was not that of the Blitzkrieg, but the mentality of the First World War where movements would be slow. Uh, they would occur within years rather than within, within days. Well, it took them about a week or 10 days before they were ready to go to Warsaw. We went to Warsaw. Unfortunately, by then, the direct route from Warsaw to Riga 
that particular uh, railroad was burned out. <coughs> Excuse me. So we were trapped in Warsaw for the duration. At first, uh, we stayed with uh, one of the Hasidim. It was one of the members of the Shmutkin family, probably Mendel Shmutkin, at Muranovska 32. And that was a large apartment house, shaped more or less like a rectangle, with some building in the center also. <coughs> it had a number of young people living there. And you, those young people organized the civil defense of their own. Polish organization of civil defense was very poor. <coughs> and so those, uh, we were there at first. I still remember some of those uh, moments we spent there. We came there just before Rosh Hashanah. And I remember the Slicha service. And I remember, I mean, there is a certain Eden that goes with it. There are certain, there are certain uh, prayers that are said, but they never sounded as heartrending as they did that particular day. Zecher bris avrom vakita sitzchok. That, but uh, I have no voice. Man, I remember singing this for Shmuel, the uh, Shmuel Zamanov. It was one of our favorite uh, Bali tefillah. But it. Uh, then, later that day, that was early in the morning, probably at around 4 a.m. or so, later that day, the Nazis unleashed a fire attack, a firebomb attack onto the Jewish section of Warsaw. I remember first a bomb hitting this, the building across the street from Moranovska 32. Now, uh, we were actually, we were facing the street, Moranovska. And I remember the front of the building being sheared off. A number of, ma a large number of victims. And then, uh, then there was this fire attack, firebomb attack, and that set Warsaw fire. And so we had to evacuate. I think I will proceed from there next, the next time. Just um, before we stop, um, who was with you from the time you left Otvatska? Who was the the group? Probably my father, my mother, probably, possibly, Chaim Meir, Rabbi Chaim Meir, that was my grandfather's manservant. Uh, probably Chaim Lieberman was my grandfather's secretary librarian. And who else? You didn't mention your grandparents. You just said your father. And oh, my mother. grandfather. Uh, somehow, I, I'm sorry. My grandfather and my grandmother were at the center. I'm describing the surroundings. <laughs> it's not, uh, that doesn't come into question, so to say. Okay. 